Well, hello! Hi! Thank you for joining us. I'm Stephanie Ramos with ABC News here at Two Door Place, a historic house here in our nation's capital. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get a behind the scenes look here, a tour, a one on one tour. Actually, two on one. We've got two. Come on in, come on in. We'll, we'll talk inside. We've got Grant Protermis, who is the curator here at Two Door Place. Bam, right there. <laughs> and Hilary Rothberg, who is the Director of Education Services here. So thank you guys so much for doing this. This is a lovely home. It is so beautiful. I'm so excited to learn more about it. So where do we start? Well, you have now just come into the vestibule of the house. And Tudor Place was designed by William Thornton, the same architect who designed the Capitol Building and a number of other houses here in the DC area. And the thing that Thornton really designed, or put into this house is the view, the temple portico. So if we can take a look right out here behind to right. Stephanie is yes. the view out this classic Roman temple. To, and at the time when the house was completed in 1816, you would have been able to see the Potomac River from here. Of course, Georgetown, the thriving tobacco port that it was, so clear view all the way down to the river, a very busy harbor down there at the time. The builders of the house are Martha and Thomas Peter. Um, Martha Peter is the granddaughter of Martha Washington, which means um, that uh, she uh, was very well positioned here in, G in Georgetown. Um, this area was then called Georgetown Heights. They bought eight and a half acres, and today we, ma we maintain five and a half of those acres. So some of that um, beautiful garden was here, a lot of the view, the big open space. Um, through the temple portico, you can see our 200-year-old tulip poplar tree that would have been here in the time of Martha and Thomas Peter. Awesome. So Martha Washington, she she she's Martha this place. Peter's granddaughter, okay. um, and Martha Washington um, was. Um, very close with her grandchildren. Um, George Washington was Martha Peter's step-grandfather. He took Martha Peter to the celebration, a big barbecue for the laying of the foundation of uh, the United States Capitol. So she was very close with um, her step-grandfather and her grandmother. So to us, these are cherished things we have here at Tudor Place that are from Martha, Pe Martha Washington. But to Martha Peter, they were just grandmother's things. And we'll see a lot of those as we go through today. And I think what's especially significant too is the house was completed in 1816. So this year we're celebrating in 2016 our bicentennial. And Tudor Place was actually a privately owned home that stayed in the Peter family until 1983. So think about that. So many historic house museums have been open since the early 20th century. This one was a private house until 1983. And it was through the vision of the last owner that um, we became a museum. So we're very grateful to the four different owners and the six generations of Peter family who lived here for preserving Tudor Place. They were the curators. They are Grant's mm -hmm. essentially um, predecessors in preserving this estate. Fantastic. Now, we just a few minutes ago, we were looking at the genealogy and looking at the, the, the setup of the family, basically, in this brochure. Taylor, who is our wonderful camera woman today, she's got that brochure. Do you want to hand it to me? Just want to give the viewers a, a, a quick look because it, it can be a little complicated. You know, there are a lot yeah. of yes. I mean, it's, it's been here since the 1800s. So, um, so and, and Taylor can give a good look at this. So just kind of lay it out for us. So here we have Martha Dandridge, who married Daniel Parker. Or Daniel Park, Park Custis. Custis. A lot of people don't realize Martha Washington, or Martha, was actually a widow when she married George Washington. Okay. So Martha's first husband was Daniel Park Custis. Gotcha. And uh, with Daniel Park Custis, she had four children, two of which survived, their son, John or Jackie, mm -hmm. and then a daughter as well. So Jackie, uh, her son actually uh, died of camp fever in Yorktown during the American Revolution. So he married into the Calvert family. He married Eleanor Calvert. And so that's where you get uh, their four surviving children are Martha Washington's grandchildren. So Martha Peter, who lived at this house, her sister, uh, Eliza, another sister, Nellie, and a brother, George Washington Park Custis, who built Arlington House across the river. Fantastic. This is like, that's like the best reality show right there. <laughs> <laughs> From back in the day. Okay, so, so this room here, gorgeous room. I mean, beautiful view. Now, do you guys ever rent out this space for, I mean, it's, I know, <laughs> for weddings or events, or, or is it just for historical purposes? And you do the the tours. We actually do um, do rentals, but most of those are garden based. Um, so a lot of people will do a ceremony in the garden and then offer their guests a tour so they have the opportunity to visit the garden um, and have a beautiful ceremony in the garden, but then learn a little something. So we have a lot of weddings 
um, that tend to be smaller, um, 70 or less, um, and people who are really enthusiastic about Tudor Place, and we'll even put information about Tudor Place in their wedding invitations, um, which is really nice. And what's neat too is a number of family weddings took place here at mm -hmm. Tudor Place that we know, even, I mean, in these rooms that we're standing in. I mean, uh, Thomas and Martha Peter's daughter, America, was married in the parlor in 1826. Their other daughter, Britannia, was married in the uh, drawing room. Three generations of the family were uh, married in the drawing room. So and that actually reminds me that the Martha and Thomas Peter had um, rather unique ways of naming their children. And the boys get pretty normal family names, John and George. Um, there's other Johns and Georges in the family, but then they go a little bit um, more creative with the girls. Um, and they get the names America, Columbia, and Britannia. Yeah. Um, and it's Britannia who's the second owner of Tudor Place. And we'll talk a little bit more about Brit um, America and Britannia in this next room if we can okay. come. And so Welcome the, to the drawing room. Wonderful. Uh, and, and talk us a little bit about the uh, the decoration. Sure. How, how long has that been in here? Because I, I mean, some of these, is gorgeous. Yeah, some of these pieces have been here as long as the house has been completed. What's especially interesting, not so much decor, but the house has pocket doors. And you typically associate pocket doors with more Victorian architecture, not this uh, early federal style of architecture, but some amazing pieces that are original to the house. And the house is really made for entertaining, and you could use these pocket doors to open them up, and visitors could flow from room to room to room. This right. parlor, drawing room, dining room, and the saloon. And I cheated a little bit. I'm not supposed to open them, but Grant will yell at me for that <laughs> later um, because I wanted to show you this beautiful wood grain. Um, and something remarkable about this family um, is that they leave us lots of stories and records. And they um, say that the um, owner, or rather the, uh, the architect, Dr. William Thornton, gave these to the family as a gift, which means that these have been here since the house was completed in 1816, which is a pretty remarkable thing, um, and then we're tasked with preserving that here at Tudor Place and educating the public. Um, this is called a tiger maple. It's a really beautiful um, wood grain. You um, can see the the striations in mm -hmm. um, the the wood there. Gorgeous, very classic look. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing about the house is you can talk about technology and how technology advances. If you want to take a look at the light fixture up here, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a gas light fixture when gas lighting was added to the house in the wow. late 1850s. But then when they added electricity in 1914, they converted it to electric. I love this. One of my favorite words is um, it's called a gas olier as opposed to chandelier. Yes. So, gas -olier. Yes. Yes. I think it's a fun word. Yes. Oh, I'll remember that one. Yeah. We'll be, there will be a quiz at the end of this. Yeah. <laughs> the family tree especially. Oh, the, oh yeah. the highlight of the quiz. <laughs> Um, so, um, as we're asking about the furnishings, yes. um, we really have quite a variety of furnishings. Things like Martha Washington's punch bowl. Um, we know for um, that the family used this. Uh, what is the recipe? There's a great story. Again, Thomas and Martha's daughter, Brittany, gives us a great story that they used the punch bowl to serve apple toddy, which sounds like a like a spice apple cider with a lot of alcohol in it. And according <laughs> to Britannia's reminiscences, there was a congressman who came here and imbibed just a little too much and then made a fool of himself. But she doesn't tell us which congressman that was in 19th century Washington. But again, the drawing room is the most formal space in the house. It's the room for entertaining. There were a number of family weddings, even funerals that took place here in this room. And it's a great place to highlight the family's connection to the Washingtons. Uh, as uh, Hillary's mentioned, with Martha Peter being Martha Washington's granddaughter and Martha Washington's will, she actually gave this print of General Washington to Martha Peter. He actually used to hang in the passage at Mount Vernon. So the family always displayed it here in the drawing room, and Britannia wrote out its history on the back. That's what we really call Britannia, the first curator of Tudor Place. Now another famous, or a, a very famous guest who came here to Tudor Place in 1824 was the Marquis de Lafayette. He of course remembered meeting Martha Peter as a young woman at Mount Vernon. So Lafayette was here in 1824 along with his son and they gave this print to the family. So the Peters always displayed these two prints next to each other on the same wall. Washington over here and Lafayette on the other side. It's pretty remarkable that this has remained here for all of these years and intact. Yes. It's still gorgeous, still beautiful. But no, just, just and, here and, so and well taken care of. And, and that's what I love about this house are, you know, not only are significant, <clears throat> excuse me, objects, historical objects, but they're also family heirlooms. Mm -hmm. All the people you see in the portraits around here are family members. So we've got, you know, 
amazing portraits of family members, people who lived here in this house. I always say with the public, either uh, when they ask me, a lot of people come and want to know who is every portrait, and I say it's either of a family member or by a family member or owned by a family member. Um, remarkable how many things that we, we have here um, from the different generations. So Martha and Thomas Peter being the first generation that built the house, um, Britannia being the second generation, um, she's the youngest of 10 children, yet it's a woman who inherits Tudor Place. Um, and we do a really, um, we're very proud of that here at Tudor Place, and we like to highlight Britannia's life as a, um, a, a single woman here at, at, at Tudor Place. And this is one of the first uh, historic landmarks in D.C., is that right? Absolutely, yes. Wonderful. I love the detail in here. I really do. Like, I could use that chair in my house right now. <laughs> I love it. And, and that's what's neat about the decor of the house is it reflects all the different generations mm -hmm. that lived here from the time the house was completed in 1816 until the death of the last owner in 1983. And each generation kind of left their mark on the house as well. And we'll look at that a little more as we keep going through the house. I always um, tell visitors that um, uh, we like to point out key objects, but if you have something specific that catches your eye, uh, we do our best. We have more than 15,000 different things in our collection. Uh, so we uh, do our best to explain what each and every one is. If I knew everything about everything, I'd probably forget to keep lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these items, these artifacts, they have been here yes. this entire, since the 1800s. Yes. The entire time. A couple of them have left but have since come back I with see. other family okay. members, okay. but a number of pieces, yes, have been here continually. And one of my favorite pieces in the collection is that little stool over there. It doesn't look very assuming. That's actually one of two surviving camp stools that George Washington used during the American Revolution. A set of 18 stools that were made for him in Philadelphia. So you think about all the places that stool has been during the American Revolution. And then after Martha Washington's death at a sale at Mount Vernon, Thomas and Martha Peter acquired a number of those stools. And there are only two that survive Amazing. today. That's here. And we're lucky that we have examples of what I call his and her stools, because mm -hmm. this stool was um, Martha Washington's stool. Um, and we're very lucky with school children, we can actually compare and contrast them, and they can see that that one's more portable. It would fold up, it would be carried, used with the, during wartime. Whereas this one's much less portable, um, and would have been more of a lady sitting room type object. And again, to Martha Peter, this is just grandmother's stool. Um, but to us, it was a stool that Martha Washington um, used, um, including this table here, Martha Washington's tea table, these beautiful um, carved um, item, uh, carved wood um, legs and around the, the edges. Very nice. So you mentioned that some of these artifacts have come back. Mm -hmm. Where from specifically, if you know, so, families or... And that's, so Britannia, who was Thomas and Martha's daughter, when Britannia actually lived here from until 1911. She died in 1911, so she lived into her 90s. And at the time of her death, because she lived so long, her estate was dispersed among her five grandchildren. She so, actually outlives both her daughter yes. and her son-in-law mm -hmm. uh, because she lived literally till the night before she turned 96. Um, and this is Britannia here. Hey, girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> we are talking about you. So, at, so at the, and, and what's very interesting about Britannia's story, she actually, uh, her, uh, she becomes a widow only 16 months into her marriage and oh, so wow. comes back here. Uh, she actually, in, uh, she married uh, well, Commodore Beverly Kennan, who was the commandant of the Washington Navy Yard. Okay. And uh, like I said, they had only been married 16 months, and they were on board the uh, Princeton, which was a battleship. They were demonstrating a new gun. There's a period engraving of it right there on the wall, if you were mm -hmm. pan up to that. And uh, while they were demonstrating the gun, it backfired and exploded. And Commodore Kennan was killed, the Secretary of State was killed, and the Secretary of the Navy. President Tyler was actually on board the boat as well, but he was below deck and not killed. So Britannia comes back to Tudor Place as a widow with a young daughter who was um, named Martha. Doing Martha, <laughs> following family tradition, and lives from 1844 until her death in 1911. So when Britannia dies, there's five grandchildren from her daughter, um, and all five of those grandchildren receive equal amounts of the um, house as well as Britannia's belongings, including the Washington collection. And what they did is they divided it up equally among the five siblings, um, but one of those um, siblings, Armistead Peter Jr., had the means to purchase out his, the shares of his other siblings. 
So he um, bought the shares of the house and then set about doing things like adding electricity. Thank you. We say thank you to yes. him to, to be able to see. Um, a steam heating system um, and plumbing. So when we can use the restrooms, we think Armistead Peter Jr. as well. Um, so um, the items were divided up even though the house stayed um, with Armistead Peter Jr. and his family. Um, and so his siblings sometimes donated them elsewhere, kept them in private collections, and we're lucky that we have a relationship with the family and some of them come back here to Tudor Place, um, which is what Grant means when we say some have come mm -hmm. back. Fantastic. So, That's great. And some of these here, these items here, it looks like this was part of Epaulettes, uniform, yes, enabled. epaulettes from uh, Commodore Kennan's uniform, part of the detailing of the collar of his uniform jacket. Right. So. Still intact. And what's really interesting, too, is the family highlighted, especially in this space, their connection to the Washingtons. They actually filled these cabinets with a number of objects that uh, were previously owned by the Washingtons and acquired at that uh, sale at Mount Vernon. And you'll, you may notice it seems a little strange to have these little um, labels that say a number and then Mount Vernon. Uh, that was the family's way of preserving and, and showing which ones were the Mount Vernon objects. So when, when they were dividing up those objects that we talked about after Britannia's death, they inventoried everything. So they got those little numbers on there. So those numbers were added in 1911. So they're just as much a part of the object's history as its Washington ownership is. Certainly not how we would do that today yeah. in modern um, preservation techniques, but um, it's the way in which the family kept track of things. So we're very grateful to them for being able to, to do that and for caring for these objects for so long. Yeah, that's how we're able to see it today. Exactly. And as you can see, there are so many objects in each room. We could spend an hour in each room of the house talking about both the 19th and the 20th century history in these spaces. Some unassuming objects. In fact, that desk behind that sofa there, that was owned by Francis Scott Key. I mean, you would have no idea, but it's hidden here. Um, it was uh, acquired by the family through a family member of Francis Scott Key's um, law partner. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly he did not write the Star Spangled Banner on it, but he was an attorney. Um, so as a lawyer, he would have um, written some important legal documents. Okay, okay. Wonderful. I love the look. You could stay in here for, as you said, for hours, just looking at every single Absolutely. detail in here. And the other thing to think about, too, with the house is room use changes over time. This was the original dining room of the house in the 19th century. And then in the later 19th century, this becomes more of a parlor or a sitting room, what we would think about as almost a living room today. And they turn this room that we're going to step into in just a second into the dining room. Let's get on over there. This room changed as well. Uh, Martha and Thomas Peter used it as a bedroom, if you can imagine that. Uh, although being um, having so many children, she probably wouldn't have wanted to take the stairs very often. Uh, so having a bedroom on the first floor was fashionable for the time. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting too, what I always love to mention as soon as we come into this room is the historical event that Mrs. Peter and Dr. Thornton's wife, Honor Marie Thornton, witnessed from this window. They stood at this window in August of 1814 and watched Washington burn when the British burned Washington. They could see the smoke from the Capitol building and the Navy Yard. And so Mrs. Thornton reported that she was here and saw that with Martha Peter. So back then, obviously, no trees, yes. just a clear view. And actually, and I will say too, in the fall when there are no leaves on the tree, you can actually see the Washington Monument from the window. Oh, wow. It's yeah. easier to believe us in the winter. Yes. <laughs> the other thing that I like to talk about in this space, of course, the last owner of the house, Armistead Peter III, was an artist. And uh, this is one of uh, his paintings that of his wife, Caroline, the uh, later residents of the house. And it's great. It's a 1925 portrait. And I just love her. I think a, r a real sense of her vivaciousness and personality comes across in there. Her uh, green cloche hat and uh, the oh, chair yeah. that she's setting in actually is still in the collection today. So we'll see that upstairs. Mm -hmm. But just I think he painted a number of portraits of her during their uh, 40 plus year marriage. But I think that one was by far the best one. Like I said, it really brings out her personality and her sense of fashion and style. And we have that jacket she's wearing in the collection. Uh, so that is we, amazing. And how do you guys verify that that item is the actual item that you have here? Just I believe you. Yes. <laughs> I believe you. And, and, and we're also <laughs> very and we're also very fortunate to have a very comprehensive archive as well. So in addition to the fifteen thousand objects that Hillary mentioned in the museum collection. We have 250,000 documents of family history. So that's diaries, financial records, uh, 
letters, photographs. So we can look at photographs of these rooms 100 years ago and see some of the same pieces of furniture in the same corner. And sometimes we'll even have the receipt. So we'll have the receipt for something um, that goes along with that chair or that table or that jacket. Um, and then we can see the, the evidence of it. And then we have the actual jacket. So we have these through lines that we can make these connections. Mm -hmm. um, but I say we, but what I mean is Grant. <laughs> and then I tell everyone that. <laughs> And, and that's what's great too is you know first and foremost Tudor Place was a family's house and we couldn't really use this house and you know the Peter family to talk about events in American history like the burning of Washington and the Civil War. Britannia turns the house into a boarding house during the Civil War and Britannia, a number of family members actually fought for both sides during the Civil War as well. Britannia, which we haven't mentioned, was actually had a connection to the Lee family as well. Mrs. Robert E. Lee was a cousin. So Britannia tended to be on the southern sympathizing side during the Civil War, but actually had a number of Union officers here boarding with her. And one of her caveats was that the war could not be discussed during dinner, obviously because her sympathies were different than the officers. So imagine that, a, a woman during the Civil War, a widow, living here, having Union officers upstairs when her first cousin is married to Robert E. Lee, and she's got nephews fighting for both sides. She's got stepsons in the Confederacy, and she's saying to Union officers, please don't speak about we don't agree. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty powerful mm -hmm. moment for a woman in history mm -hmm. to be doing that. Even back then, she, mm -hmm. she had a voice. She did, and she used it. Um, and she wrote um, lots of what we call the Britannia's reminiscences, and she wrote a ton about her place. Um, and so that's why we know a lot of what we know is through her, through her reminiscences. Fantastic. Wonderful. Okay. Well, this room is absolutely lovely. I would be remiss if we left this room without saying that we do change the um, table settings. Rather. Oh, okay. again, Grant changes the table settings. I just don't <laughs> talk about it. Um, we have more than 50 different patterns in our collection, so we um, will rotate what's on view, um, and we'll gear up for Christmas pretty soon, so you have to come back at Christmas time and see um, it decorated for Christmas. We do. We decorate the entire house for Christmas. I'm sure and not just gorgeous. Christmas decorations, but historical objects and things related to the family celebrations of Christmas as well. Absolutely gorgeous, I'm sure. This looks very springy and summery. Yes. <laughs> and so, yes, yeah, so the tablescape will be changing for a fall one fairly soon mm -hmm. as well. Well, now we can step into one of my favorite spaces right. in the house. Seems like an office. Looks like an office. Yes. Some yes. <laughs> it is. Armistead Peter Jr. used this room as his office, and his son continued that tradition. And it's just, I think it's got such a warm, I mean, you can see the walls have not been painted in over 50 years. It's just all these great accumulation of objects, and it, it's a very comfortable spot. You can imagine a roaring fire there and sitting in a chair and enjoying a good book. And we also use the desk here to highlight some objects from the archive. These are all about the family's travels, postcards from a trip to Niagara Falls and a visit to Lake George in upstate New York. Chock full of stuff in Yes. <laughs> it's also another great space to talk about changes in technology mm -hmm. as well. I mean, um, I haven't seen one of these phones in ages. Yes, the good. Uh, Actually, remember really now that I noticed these ones. 1960s. Yeah, yeah. Phone, and actually, right next to it is the earlier 1914 phone and intercom system. No laptops around here. No. 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 Typewriters. And that's anybody you guys, so many of our school children who visit today look at the rotary dial phone and say, What is that? Because oh, you know, to wow. them, a phone is an iPhone, it's something you carry around in right. your pocket, not something you have to actually dial. And for those of us that remember actually dialing those phones, it brings, um, visitors get a lot of nostalgia out of visiting here. They get to see uh, things that they remember, fans they remember growing up with, typewriters, Corona. I mean, these are name brands they grew up with. Um, so we get a lot of that nostalgia feeling. Um, and then some of this kind of quizzical, what's going on here they have feeling. Uh, we're in um, a portion of the house that actually predates the Peter family ownership. It was um, constructed in 1795. Um, and they knew that. They knew how old this area of the house was. So when Armistead Peter III needed another outlet, he asked his electrician at the time, a man named Bill Watt, um, actually still our electrician. Um, he still comes by. He's fantastic. Really? Yes. Bill um, Watt. W-A-T-T. -T. I can't. Yes. He's around. He is around. <laughs> That's um, great. Um, we, he, Armistead Peter III asked Bill what um, he could do to get him more electricity without um, going through the walls or the floors. Because his typewriter is not electric. 
He we needed plan. another right. times were changing back um, then. So Bill told us he proposed three options and this was the only acceptable option to Armistead Peter the Third. And that's why we have this strange so extension cord. Okay. So you'll see it's down like here. It's just like an outlet. It's just okay. in the middle of the room and coming from a light. <laughs> And we really have a living history here. And we like to say America's story lives here. Um, and that's because it does. We can really see the changes through time. Well, um, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, War of 1812, did that out of order. Uh, and we can go all the way through these changes of technologies, um, which really um, reflects the different tastes over time and how change happened over time in the United States, whether it's technology or um, furnishing tastes. And every room has a different feel because walking in here, it's it's cool. It's just it's it's calm. It's, it's, it's a very calm. masculine space it too, is, if you think it about is. it, yes. as opposed to a drawing room or a dining room. And yes. it's, I think it's the decor, it's the it's dark wood, it's the dark color of the wall, exactly. it's the, the pipes and other smoking paraphernalia around. Like I said, you can imagine someone sitting in here and like I said, enjoying a good book. Right. Getting to work. Yes. Hearing the hearing the type around. Yes. Okay. And what is this thing right mm -hmm. here? It's a great question. It's Nathan Lane mm -hmm. Stationer in New York. It's a copy press. It's a way to copy letters, actually. So think about it as like an early Xerox machine. If that oh my goodness. Makes sense in technology. One of my other favorite objects, just over to the right, is that camera. And what's great about that camera is that Armistead Peter Jr. was quite the amateur photographer and used that very camera to record photos of life here through the place. We're so fortunate we have photos of some of the servants here in the early 20th century and took portraits of them and the scenes of everyday life. That is fantastic. Again, I can stay in this room for hours. Okay, so this little thing right here is actually to the left of that camera. What would that be? Uh, the vase? It's a oh, glass so vase. Oh, yes. okay. Space. And, and you can it's see it's an there, interesting shape, so I thought maybe it yeah. had yeah. And, and like so many of the other rooms, there are so many objects in here that yeah. we could uh, and these books. talk about. But yes, books Actual that passed books. down to the family. And it's amazing to open one of these books and see one of the previous descendants' names in them, or they'll make little notes in the margin or something. Armistead Peter Jr. had the habit of writing the year he read a book inside of it, and then if he read it again, he'd write another year. Of it. So we'll know when he read which book. We still have books with bookmarks in them. So there'll be a gardening book with a bookmark about pigeons, and that's because they raised pigeons on the property. Um, and he's bookmarking that because that's what he's doing. Um, there'll be something about fences because they were working on fences at the time. Um, so we have all these great records, um, and we're literally getting to talk with the family about things, mm -hmm. um, which is really Let's know who this happy lady is. Right <laughs> or gentleman. No, I mean, she yes. looks like a dress. That, she is wearing a dress. <laughs> she is uh, Sarah Law Williams. So she was Armistead Peter Jr.'s mother in law. Oh, well, that's nice of him to have a photo of her in here. <laughs> Solo pic. There's a, um, a, whole sh a whole series of photos from that day. Um, so we have other photos from this day of of his wife, um, and they're in carriages with horses. So they would stage these photos, a kind of photo, family photo shoots, um, and Armistead Peter Jr. was able to preserve this, essentially, for us. So she does look very stern in that picture. We may have captured her. Oh, yeah. Sometimes we were. Yeah. Very nice. So as we kind of pass through this door, we're going to go into more of the service area of the house. So the way that the servants would have entered the dining room to serve a meal, you'll recognize the call bell system. Many people mm -hmm. from uh, Downton Abbey or another, if you've ever visited another Gilded Age house, you'll recognize uh, this style of system. These were actually the original call bells that were found up in the attic and the last owner wanted to, so mounted them up on this board uh, here. These were replaced with another call system we'll see in just a minute. But again, so now we're kind of in the more service side of the house, the behind the scenes area. And this is also where some things change slightly architecturally. So we get people and tourists who say like, what's well, with the ceiling and the, 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 the walls seem a little bit different. And that's because um, this is the only side of the house that had any renovations, major renovations done to it. And they moved a staircase. Um, so this staircase actually goes up onto um, the, um, the, the second floor. It's a, a back way up um, okay. where we'll be going later. 
Um, and where we're headed now would have been a warming kitchen, um, and it served as a city, servant sitting room um, after they added the kitchen extension, um, which is where we'll be at the far end of the house. Okay. So in 1914, when they added electricity, they actually added this electrical servant call system. And so there are little buttons in each of the public rooms and the bed chambers as well. So a family member can push one of those buttons and this box buzzes and one of those little arrows swings over to whichever room the person is pushing the button. So the servant will know which room they need to go to take tea or whatever it is they're doing. And then the intercom system with the phone then so they could and use that, that was used throughout the house as well. But this would have been a space where servants then would have awaited between or spent time between tasks, waited until they were called upon again, and doing uh, you know chores such as uh, sewing, knitting, polishing shoes, maybe some mending, but um, very much a hub of activity for uh -huh. the uh, domestic servants here in the house. That um, porcelain you see is a Wedgwood pattern, and you'll notice it's chipped. Uh, it's perfectly good, it just has a little chip, we might as well use it in a certain sitting room. So we see um, things like, um, uh, this is another example of an earlier um, uh, fixture that was fashionable in the house, the one um, above us here, um, and then they write that they moved it to the servant sitting room once it wasn't fashionable any longer because it still worked. Why not use it? So we see a lot of upcycling and recycling that the family is doing. So they're never really getting rid of anything, but maybe moving it around or saving it. Um, doors get moved, but they save them and use them for other things. Um, Armisen Peter III actually saw a house in Georgetown being demolished, and he asked for the bricks from it and then used them in the garden. Okay. So very much preservation market throughout the time. Um, all of the owners were here. And this picture here. Okay. Desk looks like we just saw it. That's the same type of desk. Same style of park. Yes, same style of park. Exactly. So you're really going to like the next space, our kitchen. <laughs> it's a 1914 um, um, installed kitchen. Uh, from um, what I understand, when the foundation took over the house, there was a 70s style avocado green kitchen. Um, so, uh, But there was some termite damage. So we were able to fix the termite damage in the floors and open this kitchen wing in the mid-2000s. And we restored it to the 1914 appearance. Um, so this gives you kind of a step back into the past um, um, what a 1914 kitchen. And we should note too that Britannia built this kitchen addition in 1876. So it was the only addition to the original house. Refrigerator. Yes. Okay, is that what this is? Yes. That was the refrigerator. refrigerator. Refrigerators in the time where you would put a large block of ice in that top part and it would keep everything under it cool. So before electricity, when right. ice would be delivered, a pair of ice tongs right there, so the ice would be put in. And then that was a refrigerator, again, before the invention of modern electric refrigerators as right. we know them today. And of course, they would not waste that ice when it melted into water. There is a drawer at the bottom where the water would channel down into the drawer, and they could save that water to use it, mm -hmm. uh, because you wouldn't want to waste that good water from right. the ice. Very smart. Very yes. smart. Very efficient. Very efficient. Yes. Things are so much easier these days. Not having to go out Walmart and get blocks of ice and fill it in. It's such a process, but they made it work. They made it work. They did. Yes. Um, even things like having to reinforce the floor uh, because they were bringing in this massive cooking instrument, and it's a dual range. It actually does coal and gas. Um, this is a reproduction, but when the family purchased this du parquet range. Um, it was the top of the line. It was your wolf range of the time. Um, you could get a good um, stove from Sears and Robot catalog, about $25, $30. They spent $230 on this stove. Um, so they were really going for the huge amount. It was. Mm -hmm. And they were really going for the top of the line um, for their entertaining. And you can see also some things haven't changed. Obviously, like the, I mean, this thing right here is this. Or, uh, well, cupcakes, cupcakes, maybe? Yes. Yeah. And actually, cupcake recipes date to the early 1800s. Uh, 
Um, yes. And, and so, you know, it's, it's really, water. yes, yeah. water. and some things are very modern in here and would have been at the time a hot water heater for uh, hot water. And what's interesting too, when they were connected to the city water, they actually left this pump right here that connects there's a cistern full of water below the floor that collected rainwater and other things. So even after they were connected to the municipal water, they still left this pump. So in the event that something happened to the city water, all they have to do is pump and they've got their own water supply. Sinks. Yeah, two different sinks in this space for two different pur purposes. This is a time period in the early 1900s where we're learning about things like IG. Um, so they're switching from using a wooden prep top table to something like a steel prep table. Oh. Um, and we're getting to um, understand um, that wood soaks up bacteria and the steel can be more hygienic. Um, likewise, the sinks, a porcelain sink will not um, absorb those bad bacteria that you don't want, whereas a stone one might. So they're, they're, they're learning these things. Mm -hmm. You can see yeah. that. Mm -hmm. process in here. Mm -hmm. Look at the items that they're using, not yeah. losing anymore. Yeah. And these are some of the same products that were used back in the 1800s? Or, or, or replicas or yes. So these, um, no, we don't have peaches in those cans. <laughs> I would hope <laughs> not. Um, Just I mean, like the brand, the brand, brand yeah, and how it was yeah. presented to folks. Back Absolutely, then. yes. These are um, the the ads on um, for them exactly right. And I will say too, when they modernized this kitchen, they actually left these original cabinets in. They didn't touch the paper Put the other cabinets around, but because the last one really liked these and remembered them from his childhood. Again, that sense of um, preservation and nostalgia, which is inherent in a lot of these objects. You'll notice this little tag here. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. Well, we're with Grant, so he yeah. can touch wow. things. I can do this. The family member has actually written its history. So Armistead Peter Jr., I can recognize his handwriting, says this is the old scoop from the flour barrel in the storeroom. So when flour would be purchased, by the barrel. Mm -hmm. And so again, he's written that history on this tag, so we'll always know the history of this object, which, you know, it just looks like it's a, a scoop, but to know its history and use, you think about every time, you know, biscuits were made or cakes or anything where flour was needed, this would have been scooped in the flour barrel to get that flour. It's amazing that that tag has stuck on there for so long. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. The dedication to preserving the past and um, sharing it with the public is really something that we're proud to be able to do here at Terra mm -hmm. Place. So you'll notice there's no dishes in there. We have all those 50 different patterns, but where are they? Mm -hmm. There's a whole room just for their porcelain. Yeah, it's called the Butler's Pantry, and that's where we're headed next. Oh, all right. doors, you know, the <laughs> openings, like you can get to one room from here, from there, how many total rooms do you have here, or are there here? Is it like house? Yeah, uh, I know that the total square footage in the house is about 11,300 okay. square feet. Depending on how you count, if you count bathrooms as well, I would, my, if I had to guess, I would say um, more than 15, yeah. definitely, uh, rooms. We could list them all. Mm -hmm. um, what about bedrooms? That's an interesting question, because uh -huh. remember how we talked about room use changes right, over time. Right, right. So do you think about, you know, that's sometimes, now a dining room, it used to be a bedroom. Gotcha. That, so uh, about, about the largest time in the house, about seven or eight okay. bedrooms. Okay. And that depends also if you count on what would have been a nursery as a bedroom. So um, it really changed over time. We'll see three when we go upstairs okay. um, that we have open to the public. So, so as the dish Hillary room, mentioned, we're now we're in, yes, okay. we're, in the dish, we're in the butler's pantry, the place where the family Hint, would store all the dishes. All yeah. the dishes. <laughs> and what what and you think about too during this time period, especially in the early 20th century, when uh, service when meals were many different courses and each course required its own separate plate, we needed these large sets of uh, china for service. And what I also love in 1914 when they added the radiator system, they made that one a plate warmer. So you think, hey, put a plate on there to get it warm before you plate a meal to take it out into the dining room. And you come here in the winter and oh. it still gives off a little bit of heat. Yes. Okay. She's really, we're very, so we'll find Hillary here. Just yes. <laughs> 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 Try to stay warm. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, but this is really the opportunity to see many of those patterns since we can only have one out on the table at any given time. Mm -hmm. And they range, um, there's um, Meissen, which is a German manufacturer, there's Colport and Wedgwood, which are English. This is a Belgian set, the birds um, that are pretty striking that you see here. Um, and we, it's kind of tricky. This is a, a set from the 1770s, uh, but it hasn't been here since the 1770s. It was actually purchased by the last owner, Armistead Peter III. So even in the 1970s, he's not going for trend, trendy furniture. Um, he's choosing antiques and things that'll look nice with his existing in here, things that he has from his family. Just it's, like these. It's also a great place to talk about some of those things that would have been present on a fine set, finely set dining table in the late 19th or early 20th century that we don't even think about today, like crystal knife rests. So you wouldn't have to lay your knife down on the table or on a plate. Mm -hmm. You've got just a little, looks like a little barbell. You just rest your knife on it. That's and, a fancy barbell. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, all of the, and finger bowls and wow. all these specialized, you know, you might, if you have a fish course, a special fork and knife for that. And you might sit down and have 12 or 14 pieces of flatware at just your place at the table. And what you see here is actually only a portion of what we have because we have storage. So we have things in storage um, that we rotate out. Um, and sometimes we'll put out things like this area of the house was sometimes used as a dark room by Armistead Peter Jr. We mentioned it before. We'll put out some of his antique cameras and we'll rotate things. So it's another opportunity we have to showcase the things that we can rotate um, and really make the house come alive. Now, are any of these sets uh, usually used for a specific holiday? Like, for instance, this is the Christmas set or Thanksgiving <laughs> or... We'll or have, you know? We're laughing because sometimes we'll have a record where um, it's like a list of which, what person is sitting where at the dining table and what set should be put out with what silverware on um, what pattern and everything. So we'll have an exact record of who sat where, what they were eating on, what silverware they were eating on. Um, and some things were more every day, and some things are much more for those um, fancier, fancier yeah. events. Yeah. It just melts on everything. Yes. It makes me want to go home and just be a lot better at just documenting <laughs> my life, our life, our family's life. And, and that's really what interesting use. because you think about how so many of our communications today are electronic. It's email and text versus letter. And looking through the archive and seeing where if family members are traveling, they might, might like a husband and wife might write two or three letters a day home to each other. Whereas we would just, with a simple phone call or a text or an email, just, you know, this yeah. is what I've done today, it's in a letter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, letters are, it's a physical thing, it's something you can store. So much, everything today is electronic. And we um, will even have letters um, from the, some of the family members were in Europe when the Titanic sank, um, and they knew people aboard. Um, so Armistead Peter Jr. saved newspapers from then, and then we have the letters from his siblings talking about how they're nervous they've got to take that same journey. Um, yeah, so they're getting on a ship to come back to the United States the same route the Titanic took. And they're here, so we have these records um, in this history, and we can actually say that people were nervous about travel after that, um, and we can compare that to modern things, um, and 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 we have these through lines that we can use, which is really exciting. Absolutely, absolutely, well, wonderful. All right, so what's uh We're almost down done here? the downstairs. What? If you're not tired enough and ready for the upstairs. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. It's just like it's sitting here for, you know. <laughs> no, that's, that's actually a table. 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 That's table. left over from when Britannia used the house as a boarding house, and they've got to see all these officers and boarders in places and get dinner ready for such a yeah, large it's space. Yeah, it's another space for that. It's like early Ikea, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, flip it up, it's like, it is. yeah. Um, and I mentioned earlier the Francis Scott Key Desk. This is actually a great view of it from here. Um, like you had noticed um, in the, the picture, and it comes apart. It's, I mean, it, it's just another example of some of these hidden treasures we have. Everywhere you turn, there's something different and new to discover here. And, and it's actually, it's, it's a partner's desk, as we mentioned. So two law partners would sit on either side facing each other. And uh, Judge Dunlop, who was uh, Francis Scott Key's law partner, was a Peter family member. So it's from Judge Dunlop that Armistead Peter Jr. acquired the desk. A beautiful desk. Not a very large space for two. Yeah. Like, yeah don't spread out. out. <laughs> don't get don't your paperwork over They do the really need their laptops, I guess, right? You know, just their legal documents. So, so. so we're um, headed back towards that front door where you, you welcome us in, and we're going to head upstairs. As we said before, about seven different bedrooms we'll see. Um, we'll see three today. 
Um, I always remind visitors before we go up the stairs that it is um, to have 16 foot ceilings. That means we have to go up two and a half flights of stairs. Um, so bear with us once we get to the top and get a nice cool burst of air. Yes, um, a number about? of <laughs> English prints depicting uh, fox hunting and fox other hunting. equestrian scenes. There's actually a full attic over this block of the house as well, and it's a space where the family would store travel trunks and things. So that's why we have this travel trunk setting right here, mm -hmm. as in someone who just got back from a journey, the trunk's going to be taken upstairs. And of course, now we keep our Christmas decorations. Yeah. A sturdy looking trunk. Yes. yes. Um, and of course, we have the the um, the receipt for it because why not? <laughs> yes, we know exactly where she purchased and and who she purchased it from. And because of all the stickers on there, we know all the places around the world it was used. Imagine traveling in that time period where, you know, a woman might change outfits three or four times a day for various purposes, and so you need a large trunk to take everything with you. You know, the, the days of the the stove above, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, carry on suitcase were. <laughs> Not that time. Yeah. Plenty of space, but then she had to lug that around because I didn't see any wheels on. No. Oh, uh, you, people, people carry. People yeah, carry for her. Yeah, carry things to carry it and load it for you on the ship. Right, right, right. So, so where are we now? We are in what's called the upper hall. Um, so it's as you come upstairs to the main area of the bedroom. We'll go to what's called the master, or rather the main bedroom um, next. But I do like to pause at what's behind you. Um, it's a rather unassuming chest on chest. It's called that because it's actually two pieces, a chest on a chest. Um, this is one of the pieces that George Washington used. Um, I use it with children to illustrate that um, we know Lincoln was tall. Right? There's lots of stories of that, but Washington was also tall. He was over six feet tall as well. Um, so I, when I stand next to it, you can really tell that I, I couldn't figure out how to get in those top drawers. So he was able to get in there, no wishes at all. And, yeah. and what I think is interesting about it, George Washington actually purchased it used. He purchased it secondhand from George William Fairfax. Fairfax lived at Belvoir, which was adjoining, an adjoining plantation. And when Fairfax goes back, he, uh, Fairfax goes back to England, and before he does, it has a sale of all these things. And so George Washington uses that sale to acquire some very fine English uh, pieces of furniture, such as this piece that was made in London in the 1760s. And then again, Thomas and Martha Peter acquired it at the Mount Vernon sale in 1802. It's been here at Chamber Place. And this is something that we would see today. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. it's just a very classic it's a very, piece. Exactly, it's a very classic uh, piece of furniture, a very classic form, too. So. Mm -hmm. So one thing um, that I know a lot of visitors enjoy is actually getting to see one of our bathrooms. Um, so you can see it from one angle on this side, and then we'll go into the master and be able to see it from the other angle as well. Um, it's not, it's pretty rare to <laughs> have a bathroom as part of your tour, um, but it's one of those 1914 restaurants. I love this. I could totally live here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's go yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. so we, uh, we appear in the bathroom from this side. I love this side of it too. Yes. Um, you have a uh, both... toilet seat. I love it. And then, of course, um, something you don't always see in American homes of the day. Um, just next to the toilet. That's another one. Um, Caroline Peter, our the woman with the green hat downstairs, she had grown up in France, so she asked for that. Um, they always thought of it as Britannia's room, even though um, Armistead Peter Jr. and Armistead Peter III would have also used it as their master bedroom. Um, and they would have had a fantastic view um, across the river from here as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. 
And plenty of sunlight also once those shutters open. Yeah. 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 You can see why they didn't add electricity to 1914 <laughs> when you're in here. But also just, you know, a number of great family photos and of various family members. So uh, the last owner, Armistead Peter III and his wife Caroline on their wedding day in 1921. And then just to the right of that, we have them uh, during the Second World War. He was in the Navy and she was a volunteer for the Red Cross here at Georgetown Hospital. So a great photo of them together in their respective uniforms. He actually rose to the rank. He served in both World War One and World War Two, and became a lieutenant commander. Yes, correct. And then on the far left, that's uh, his aunt. So basically, Britannia's granddaughter Agnes. It was her trunk who we saw. Wow. Only girl, story. five uh, five children, only girl, and the youngest. They're very protective of her, um, and we see that in writings about um, with her and about um, what Agnes will do. Um, she's kind of a staff favorite here. Um, she was 73 when she married for the first time. Uh, she married um, a man who was 88, um, and wow. she described the two years they had. In, it's never too late. And she describes the two years um, they had together before he died at the age of 90 as the most wonderful in her life. So um, it, it is really never too late. Yeah. That is wonderful. So what's this little thing right here, this core that I see? Is that actually, it's yes, to that, the So that, that servant, servant call lock system that okay. we saw downstairs. So if I were to push this, that would actually buzz and probably startle the tour that's down there right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it does. And it would, so it would let the servant know that you know someone here in this bedchamber needed was ready to dress, wanted Needed tea, something. whatever. Okay. And this wallpaper, I mean, it's it's amazing. <laughs> it amazes me that it is still up. I mean, you can still you can see some some damage, some, yeah, some damage, damage, but it's still. I mean, it's still a gorgeous room. And um, this was installed in the the 1970s. Um, however, when they installed this wallpaper, they were still looking at older wallpaper patterns. So they're looking at Victorian patterns um, and from the same companies that are still making the older patterns. So even though um, it's a later um, item, they're looking to the past for inspiration. This is what they would have had. Exactly. And you know, that's what's significant about the house too, is both Armistead Peter Jr. and Armistead Peter III you know, realized the historical significance of the house and didn't add a, you know, modern wing on the back or didn't, you know, refurnish it with, you know, 1950s style or 1960s style furniture. They still, as Hillary mentioned earlier, acquired antiques to keep furnishing the house in the taste of the earlier generations. We're grateful for that because that means we got some pretty cool stuff. <laughs> Beautiful. It's, it's, there are timeless pieces. I mean, you can Exactly, and um, I think it really resonates with visitors too because they, they, I've had visitors routinely tell me things I didn't know about our furniture. Oh, I have a piece like that. My grandmother mm -hmm. um, used it. Um, I really cherish it. And um, so that's actually one of the more exciting things about getting to work with the public is that we learn from the public all the time, which is um, really exciting for me, I have to say. And I think people always say that it feels like a house they could live in. It's a very comfortable yes. house, or it reminds them of a grandmother's house or a favorite aunt's house. And I think, too, sometimes, like, there are mornings where I've walked upstairs and you almost get a hint of, like, a whiff of mothballs or something, mm -hmm. a, a smell that reminds you of, you know, a childhood memory of someone else's house. Mm -hmm. But um, It's very homey. Even though it's, it's a large home, lots of different rooms, it's still... So it's a cozy feel. We've actually heard from visitors, it seems like the family who lived there just like left one day. Um, they left everything where they won, the way they used it. Um, they just left it where it was. Um, and we really love hearing that because that's, we want you to feel welcome. Um, we want visitors to come and feel like they're a part of this experience and this story because this is the story. Um, and visitors, and even today, um, visitors really get to experience um, what it was like, life was like through different time periods here. So this room here, um, another another bed chamber used mm -hmm. by guests, used by Caroline Peters, her morning room. So you see her desk and uh, correspondence set there. Uh, also, I'll direct your attention to the closet. What I think is especially, uh, you'll see it's actually furnished still. You'll see a number of uh, Caroline's pieces of clothing, dresses and jackets from the 1920s up until the 1950s, as well as hat boxes and everything you'd expect to find in. See that mirror, for instance. I could totally use that mirror at home. It is 
<laughs> Fabulous piece. Exactly. Um, Very nice. Dobbs, I guess that was the maybe a big time brand back in New York. Yes, yes. on Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. And the closet is also a neat space to see the curvature of the wall of the temple portico downstairs. The temple is the full two stories of the wall, so you can see that curved wall. And William Thornton, the architect, likes to use spaces with curved walls to put closets in. You see the same thing at the Octagon House, just in over by the White House that he designed as well. And these hangers, we certainly don't see these yeah, we actually, type well, of that's hangers a, that's these a, that's days. A, that's a modern thing actually for oh, very really? padded for, for conservation of because you I think about it, when you've got these historic pieces of clothing just setting on a wire hanger could actually that stress the mm -hmm. clothing so they're extra padded for okay. that but so you can have them for many more years yes yes and as i mentioned caroline grew up in france so she actually uh, enjoyed french fashion so we have some hermes and lavan brands we know now um, in the collection so it's um exciting and sometimes it's really it's really exciting to see people come alive when they see things they recognize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and well, like me right here, you said Hermes. Yes. Is there another Hermes bag in there? <laughs> yeah. uh, clothes. And that, Clothing. Yes, yeah. the leather jacket that you see at the far left in the closet is a 1920s Hermes leather jacket. So, yeah. and she had a hat Do they know that well. that jacket is here? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope they're watching. And <laughs> that is amazing. Another one of these. Yes. Yes. In every room. Yes. Very nice. Um, so we only have a portion of the textiles on view. We actually use one of the other bedrooms for textile storage, and we are in need of a more modern textile storage facility, and we have a long-term plan for that, um, for, for the, the health of the, the textiles. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, just another really great bedroom, but um, given that it has a little extension to it, which is this, the third bedroom I was talking about, um, you can see the last three generations are children's toys. Um, so really another a nostalgia piece for wow. uh, visitors to see uh, what you see on the floor there, that's a game of four cheesy. Um, and we know that Armistead Peter III and Britannia played Parcheesi together. Mm -hmm. uh, there's roller skates and ice skates used by the family, snowshoes and baseball bats, um, actual everyday objects used by the family. That were just left here in the house by the earlier generations. And... My particular favorite, I love the teddy bears. I think those are fantastic mm -hmm. on the bench over there. Wow. Such a different time, but still items that we use today, but obviously they've like, just Again, toys have changed, changed but yeah. it's still, children today still have teddy bears and play board games. Exactly. And skates we and use this, bats. Yeah, and we use this as a way to compare and contrast, because children now might do um, ice skating, but they don't have these like platform that you strap onto your shoes, or mm -hmm. um, like the, the roller skates there actually have leather straps that go around your existing shoes. Um, so we can compare and contrast them for children. Um, and that represents a really great way for them to learn. Um, and we see um, that clicking for them, which is mm -hmm. really exciting. Yeah. Children's portrait and mm -hmm. this uh, plane here. It's funny because in one of my son's rooms, I have a plane, mm -hmm. like a wooden plane <laughs> that is hanging from the ceiling in the corner, just like that. So it just still styles transcending through And it's a time. model of the Wright Brothers mm -hmm. plane um, done by Armistead Peter III. Right. He built it himself. Well, mine's from Pottery Barn. It's not that exquisite, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that is great. Amazing. Uh, the little girl reading the book just across the room um, is the last child to grow up here. Her name was Anne um, there. Um, and she's the last child to grow up here at Tudor Place. She actually did that little drawing of a squirrel to the right of her. Really? <laughs> yeah, she did that drawing. It was a gift to her grandfather, Armistead. Oh, very and talented. Her, very talented. That's not a... Yeah. That's a bad one still. Runs in the family. There are several family artists. Well, then we do have the sea chest over here. <laughs> so the thing that I always like to end my tours and point out is this image over here. I'll grab an enlargement of it. 
So this is actually a photo from our archive that shows Armistead Peter, the last owner with Britannia, his great-grandmother, who we've been talking about. So you have Martha Washington's great-granddaughter with her great-grandson. Wow. The photo is taken just out on the uh, garden path. And what I think that really speaks to the comprehensive nature of our museum collection as well, the invalid chair or wheelchair that Britannia is setting in in the photo is right. We're back downstairs. We went down our two and a half flights of stairs back to the front door. We want to thank you so much for coming to visit, and we hope you'll come back and experience Definitely. the other seasons here at Tier Place. Definitely. Thank you both so much for your time. Beautiful home, so historic. We learned so much. And you guys took your time going through absolutely everything. So now you guys have to, if you're here in Washington, D.C., you have to make your way out here to Tudor Place. So much to see, so much history. And again, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye. See ya. Close the door. Oh, yeah.